Mark Harris, you are one of those Oscarologist extraordinaires, to those of us who know you in the business. You've been at this game for a long time. You're usually right, uh, and you take a very studious, thoughtful approach to Oscars instead of the, the kind of gunslinger approach others may take. Uh, so looking at the race this early, it's, it's, it's dangerous to make any firm predictions, of course, but looking at your predictions at Gold Derby, you've, you've got tw 12 years of slave off front. Let's start there. Uh, and give me your sense of why that's the front runner. Are you confident that it may not be? You know, in other words, where do you stand on all this? Sure. Well, like everybody, I have um, 12 years of slave and gravity as my top two right now. I think pretty much everybody is is keeping those in their top two. Um, and I don't feel strongly that it will win. You know, I don't feel strongly, honestly, that anything will win in November. But the analogy I'm using is that if this is the year uh, of the Hurt Locker versus uh, Avatar, you know, if we have a, a, a small, lower budget, perhaps lower grossing, um, socially conscious movie about a painful piece of American history, and that's up against a technologically spectacular film that has a great audience appeal and maybe a somewhat thin script, that in the end, the, the smaller movie about the bigger issue uh, is probably the winner. Um, with the Academy, but you know, I could certainly, there, there's a lot of uh, changes in the weather ahead of us in the next uh, three or three Right, and uh, Avatar and Gravity both have the fact that they're sci-fi films in common, I like that analogy you're, you're making, and, and what uh, is interesting about the uh, uh, 12 Years a Slave situation is it doesn't have the warm fuzzies. It's not that movie that gets you all teary-eyed like the King's Speech that they normally like and Slumdog and all that. But, right. some, but sometimes uh, that's not what they go for. Sometimes they do like the, uh, uh, the No Country for Old Men and The Hurt Locker. But I'm very yeah. skeptical. I, I, I don't have it in first. I'm just putting Wolf of Wall Street at, at number one because it's a placeholder. I just moved uh, American Hustle out, and I don't even know why. I'm just I, I cannot commit to a movie that we've seen so far because if I have to, I would say it's Gravity. But like you, I'm queasy about all that. I, I'm I've left out uh, The Wolf of Wall Street and American Hustle from my predictions, not because I don't have any um, confidence in them, but because I haven't seen them. Uh, nobody who I know has seen them, and I would just rather personally keep them out of my own discussion until I feel a little more confident that, that I know what I'm talking about there. Right. So okay. it's nothing against those movies. It's just I don't know yet. Michael Mustow, our buddy, said yesterday that he thinks Gravity is this year's um, Argo, and his argument goes this way, that it's that it's uh, you know got the box office success, it has the... Uh, uh, the urgent social message, in this case, of course, about space garbage and all of that. It's a movie with a high repeat viewer rate, and he thinks it's the kind of movie that's just going to hold on, and then, or no, it was, it was Keith Simonton who was saying that, that uh, uh, one of our other pundits, but the argument that goes that, that I'm posing is, could Gravity be this year's Argo, meaning that it goes, it lurches out front, falls behind, lurches out front, falls behind, and we just should have stayed on that pony all along. Um, it certainly could be, although I would dispute the urgent social message element of um, gravity. I think space garbage is is stretching it. I don't think it's something that, like, you know, Angie Dickinson or Eric Estrada or the other members of the Academy are, like, sitting at home wringing their hands about what are we going to do about space debris. Um, you know, if people are voting on social message, if if that is the thing that grabs the Academy this year then 12 Years a Slave wins. I mean, it's it's about a big, dark, tough, painful piece of American history. And, you know, sometimes I think the Academy often uh, votes in reaction to itself and what it's been doing for the last couple of years. And if we've had, you know, comparatively lightweight movies like The Artist uh, and, and The King's Speech, sort of cheerful, inspirational movies winning, um, and also... Uh, a run of movies that haven't been about uh, the United States winning, you know, Slumdog, The Artist, The King's Speech, um, 
12 Years a Slave is a way of returning to that and saying, you know, that we're, we're going to say that the mission this year was to, uh, to take on a big piece of America and our own history and look at it unsentimentally. Um, but, you know, certainly Gravity is immensely popular. I think everybody who's seeing it really um, enjoys it. I, I think maybe, you know, as we both know, sometimes huge popularity can work against a movie um, for uh, the Oscars. Every once in a long while you get a big blockbuster like Return of the King that wins, but um, you can also get into a head uh, where people say, um, okay, well it's already been amply rewarded at the box office and maybe we don't need to add to that by, by giving it a Best Picture prize. Mm -hmm. I buy that. And this year we have a lot of studio movies in the mix, more so than we normally have. Uh, you know, Captain Phillips is certainly an example of that. Gravity is. Right. Uh, certainly Wolf of Wall Street and some of the others would be that. Let's jump over to the best actor race. This is where I, I think uh, the element of a race really makes the contest fascinating, and that is I think that the critics awards out front are going to be split between Matthew McConaughey and uh, Chiwetel uh, Ejiofor, for whatever his name is. And uh, I don't think Robert Redford's going to pick up anything there, but I agree with you that he's going to win. My conundrum is this. Where does he start to win? Does he pick up the Golden Globe? Because they are a little more respectful at the HFBA to the, the old glamorous stars. Or can he actually win SAG? Or is it a, pos is it a year where he could actually, like Adrian Brody, win nothing beforehand and then suddenly win the Oscar? How do you see that playing out? Adrian Brody situation because the thing about Adrian Brody was the penis came in really really late um, and and built its momentum late and crested at the perfect time Redford you know all is lost is out it's been in theaters now for three weekends so I think if he doesn't pick up any critics awards along the way then he's actually in trouble in terms of uh, winning um, I think he's gonna have to grab something I uh, that he will win a Critics Award or two, um, because I, my, my gut is that um, that movie than Dallas Buyers Club, uh, Matthew McConaughey's movie is. I'm not sure that, um, I mean, it's funny because in a way they're both performance pieces. I mean, All Is Lost is a complete showcase for Redford. There's, you know, nobody else to look at. Um, and and McConaughey's performance is obviously at the center of Dallas Buyers Club. Uh, so if people are, you know, weighing the two of them against each other, I think All Is Lost may have the advantage uh, with some voters because it's the, the more original movie. But on the other hand, maybe they're weighing Redford against Bruce Dern for the kind of older guy, Lifetime Achievement Award, uh, you know, and, and Nebraska hasn't opened yet, so we don't really know how that's going to resonate um, with, with critics and with audiences. I mean, it's obviously going to get very good reviews, but we don't know how it's going to hold up in people's minds over, over several weeks of release. You've got Captain Phillips in your third position for Best Picture now, Best Director. You've got him in second place, Tom Hanks, that is, for Best Actor. Uh, how do you see the possibility of Hanks winning? You, you, you just think it's not going to matter that he's won twice before. They're just happy to see him again, and he does, he does kind of steal the movie in terms of performance moments at the end. I think if Hanks had never won an Oscar, he would win this year. I think the performance is that good. Um, it, it's. I think the movie has shown that um, it. You know, the danger with something like Captain Phillips is that audiences would really take it as like a a spoonful of cod liver oil. That it, that that it's just a nasty medicine movie about a difficult moment. Clearly, the box office shows that's not the case. They took it as a a sort of. Uh, very, very exciting suspense thriller about something real. So the movie's done well. He's amazing in it. I do think the fact that he's got two Oscars already um, works against him, uh, especially if you're uh, weighing him in a field that includes uh, a bunch of guys who have never won. You know, Redford, Dern, uh, Edgefor, um, McConaughey, I think, has never even been nominated. Uh, Redford and Dern have only been nominated once. Um, so, uh, the, of course, this would be Edgefor's first uh, nomination. 
weighing all of that against two Oscars, I don't think there's going to be urgency to give him a third. Although, as we know, Daniel Day-Lewis did pick up a third last year, so there, there's precedent now. Right, and Meryl Streep recently picked up a third. We have Ingrid Bergman, Jack Nicholson, among the other few people to have taken home three. Um, I think uh, you haven't seen Saving Mr. Banks yet, have you? I have not, which is why I'm holding off on, on guessing, although I, I, I have been following the buzz, and, and I know people are, are really liking it. Yes, I saw it last night, and I think that's where we're going to see him pop up is for the win. I think uh, he, he's just too much like Tom Hanks in Captain Phillips is what my thinking is there, but uh, he really he embodies a character and gives us an accent and all of that, and it gives us the big teary big moments, too, in uh, Saving Mr. Banks. I'd be interested to see what you think about it when you uh, see it. I, Not, I guess my curiosity about that movie, um, and I know this is a kind of unfair thing to hold against it, but if we have, like, slavery, AIDS in the 1980s, getting uh, kidnapped, the, the inequities Somalian pirates face in the world economy, um, you know, uh, the history of racial injustice in the United States in the 20th century, in the butler, um, uh, how is the making of Mary Poppins <laughs> going to <laughs> stack up I know, I know, I know. I, hey, it's their think... story. It, it's the Oscar, you know, voter story because it's a movie about Hollywood and it's a movie about the making of a classic. Doesn't that kind of make it special? Well, maybe it does. And I should say, I think that deciding who who gets an Oscar and who doesn't get an Oscar by importance of subject matter is a terrible way to decide. And I hope it's not decided that way in any category. But I'm just saying it's possible that the movie may... Um, feel lightweight to some people, uh, uh, given the kind of unusually heavy and, and dark and intense material that is in the field this year. Mm -hmm. Moving over to supporting actors, let's talk about Oprah. I'm with you, kiddo. I think Oprah is going to win here. A lot of the uh, more gritty pundit types are saying it's going to be Lupita from 12 Years a Slave. What's your view here? Really, really, really close call. I mean, it, it does feel like it's one of the two of them, and, and with Oprah Winfrey, you have the sort of what do you get the woman who has everything problem, like the woman who has, you can't even say she has everything but an Oscar because she has an Oscar, right? She has, she has an honorary Oscar. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, Harvey Weinstein, who we both know is an ace campaigner and and does not leave anything on the table when he campaigns, is really, really going to have to figure out uh, a good approach for an Oprah campaign um, because there's also a long history of uh, honoring newcomers in supporting categories, you know, honoring someone like uh, Jennifer Hudson for Dreamgirls, who had never made a movie before. Um, and and everybody loves the Cinderella story, and uh, Lupita Nyong'o is certainly, you know, has the potential to be this year's Cinderella story. I think she's going to get a lot of critical support, too. I don't see any critics awards going to Oprah Winfrey or to The Butler. I agree. Um, you know, it'll that'll really have to make its mark. Uh, in places like SAG and the Golden Globes. Now, you've got uh, June Squibb from Nebraska in your fifth spot. I don't even have her in my top five, but I'm, I'm going to put her in. I think she could pull off a real surprise this year. Maybe she's the newcomer and the veteran all at once because she gives you that sassy defiance in her role that they often like to see. Right. I mean, those prizes also go to people like Brenda Fricker, you know, someone who's who's around and suddenly, fairly late in her career, registers in a really good role. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot, I feel like, we don't know in that category. Is, is one of the female performances in American Hustle suddenly going to stand out? Um, you know... Uh, all we've really heard about August Osage County is out of Toronto, but we don't know how that movie plays, and, and you know, it's so full of strong parts for women that you could fill the category with, with you know, supporting actresses from August Osage County. So, for instance, if Margot Martindale is great in that movie, and, and that is a part, the part she's playing, that won the actress who played it on Broadway, a Tony Award, um, then that could change the complexion of the race really interestingly. 
Good. It plays tonight, by the way, at AFI. I've not seen the movie yet. I'm seeing it tonight. So I'll see it in front of an audience, which will be interesting to see how it plays. I think Harvey's going to be there, too. So he may be uh, guiding the spirit of the room in the way he likes to control <laughs> everything. Let's double back to, to the lead actress race where you've got Kate Blanchett in the first position. I do, too. I, I think that she... Uh, She's never won in lead. It's a very showy role. She's popping pills. She's, she's giving this kind of majorly angst-driven performance, and it's about a subject that I think obsesses Oscar voters, and that is the, the terror that they all feel that they may lose their wealth someday. This is a town driven by pursuit of, of wealth, of course. Uh, so, uh, But Sandra Bullock, I think, this is my theory with her, is that I think Sally Field was right when she said, when they like you, they really, really like you. And we see stars like Hilary Swank or Sean Penn win one year and then not that many years later win again. And there is a honeymoon period that you have when you're at the Oscars that I think uh, Sandy is still in that, in that window. So if there's a big gravity surge, and maybe even if there isn't, she could do it. But I think it's essentially between those two. I agree. Uh, I, I think, you know, that's a funny category this year because uh, of all of the major contenders that we're talking about, including not only those two, but um, uh, Meryl Streep and Emma Thompson and Judy Dench, they all have Oscars already. Yeah. So it, it, nobody's going to win because uh, anybody thinks they're owed, you know? It's, it's, it's going to be uh, other factors. And, and it could be, yes, that Sandra Bullock is still riding this... Um, this wave from the blind side and also you know like all is lost gravity is almost a one-person show I mean she gets to carry the movie in a way that women almost never get to carry high-budget studio movies so that seems like a kind of step forward on the other hand Kate Blanchett is so great and there's such a long history of rewarding actresses for Woody Allen movies but how long has it been since we saw an actress in a Woody Allen movie just completely take the center of the movie and make it her own? I mean, it's interesting to me because Allen has this amazing history uh, in the Academy, but it's actually been, you'd have to go all the way back to Geraldine Page in Interiors to find a woman nominated for Best Actress as opposed to Best Supporting Actress in a Woody Allen movie. And... She really, like, this is an ensemble piece, but she is the star. She owns this movie, and it's such a strong performance and, and you know, performed very, very well for uh, a Woody Allen movie. I think she's going to pick up a lot of critics' awards, a lot of critic support, and um, she, I would still give her the edge, but that's one that could really change. I'm very leery of Amy Adams. I think there is the possibility that she could be the overdue ingenue in this race. She's had four nominations over seven years. We haven't seen American Hustle, of course. Uh, there is one publicist I know who's kind of associated with the movie, so I don't know whether to trust her views or not. She has seen it. She said that we're all in, the, in this pundit circle underestimating Amy Adams, and she could surge out there. She certainly takes on the babe factor with the kind of plunging neckline pictures we see as outtakes from the film. That could be interesting uh, that at this point we're not appreciating her as a contender who could ambush it later. And that, that's what makes the race fun, of course. Right. So, certainly true. And, and, you know, like I said, I'm not factoring anybody from American Hustle out. The movie is just a huge question mark to me. I, I can't wait to see it. Uh, you've got Fassbender in first place for supporting actor. Uh, we've seen a lot of villain roles win lately. We've seen, you know, Christoph Waltz win his first time and, and Javier Bardem and Heath Ledger and it used to be that it was very rare that the villain roles won. You could look back at Anthony Hopkins, but normally the more heroic roles win. What is going on in this category where we suddenly like villains? Well, you know, villains are great parts. Um, it, you know, it's, in a way, you could say that Michael Fassbender's part, like, he almost gets more to do in the movie in terms of variety than, than um, uh, Chiotel Ejiofor does. You know, it, it's it's... In, in a way, more, more of an acting treat to make someone suffer on screen than to be made to suffer on screen. And, uh, you know, he's a really good actor. I think he probably came close to a nomination for uh, Shame, but it was not an Academy movie, obviously. Um, I'll say, though, that in this category, I have 
no confidence in my number one pick. Um, I, I think uh, I'll plead guilty to um, going with the herd on this one, but I think, um, you know, best, best supporting actor is a category that can be shaken up very, very late in the game. I mean, I don't think any of us at this time last year were saying that um, uh, Christoph Waltz was going to win. Because right. we hadn't seen Django, we didn't know what was up. So, uh, you know, who knows, with the, the incredibly great ensembles in both Wolf of Wall Street and American Hustle, maybe there's a home run performance in one of those movies that we don't know about. Maybe it's Hanks in Saving Mr. Banks, like you say. Um, I don't think it's going to be um, Jared Leto, because I don't see support for the movie going deep enough to carry him all the way to, um, you know... Uh, a, a win. I, the, the only thing I'll guess in this category is that I think the winner of Best Supporting Actor is going to come from a Best Picture nominee. I think oh. it won't be uh, someone in a movie that doesn't make the, the final cut. So you're saying uh, James Gandolfini, not so much. I don't, uh, I don't think he's going to no, win. I love the performance, yeah. But, but yeah, I think in this category... Um, Pro, which is going to be a close category, what will probably tip it is overall support for the movie. Right. That's just a, a guess. That, of course. Right. I, I was it, wrong. It, you know, last year, if that if I had been right about that, then Alan Arkin would have won for uh, Argo. <laughs> so, right, you know. right, right, right. But, yeah, Javier Bardem with No Country for Old Men. Um, uh, you know, yeah, there, there's a lot of that going on here. Yeah, I, I wondered about Gandolfini because uh, there is some, a lot of sentiment for him there. He is also a lead performance, you know, parading down in that in that supporting slot, and often that is you know an advantage. It's certainly what Christoph Waltz had in his favor last year. He wasn't right. really supporting anybody in that movie. Uh, that's always a factor that we're looking for. Right, and size of the part is absolutely. A, a big deal, and I don't think anybody ever gets penalized because they're miscategorized. Like, I can't think of a supporting actor who lost because voters kind of said, oh, well, he's really a lead and we're not going to vote for him. You know, they <laughs> right, right, right. they don't think that way. What I think. movies do you act personally really like this year? Um, I... Uh, as a fan. As a fan, um, a couple of things that haven't been... Um, talked about that much in terms of awards that I really loved were um, Before Midnight, I thought was really fantastic. I'm, I'm on record as being a big fan of uh, Enough Said. You know, I'm, I'm married to a screenwriter and I really love movies that are written. Um, and, and, you know, Before Midnight and uh, Enough Said and Blue Jasmine uh, also have really fantastic scripts, I think. Um, I'm not in the, you know, camp of wild reverence and enthusiasm for 12 Years a Slave, but I, I find a lot to admire uh, in that movie and in Gravity um, and in Captain Phillips. Uh, I think those are three good movies that, that have earned their their spots uh, in, in the discussion. Um, and, you know, I'm very, very curious to see if combined Wolf of Wall Street and American Hustle change the conversation um, in, in the race. You know, they're both about you know, money and power and, and d takes on different pieces of recent American history. And, and, you know, if they're both really good, then we could be talking about this in a whole different um, framework. Right. And I think Marty, of course, is somebody that they want to give a second Oscar to. There are There's an elite club of directors who have won twice, like Milos Forman and Oliver Stone and Clint Eastwood and Steven Spielberg. They don't seem to mind to give that second one away, and he certainly belongs in that club. What is against working against him is it's unlikely that Wolf of Wall Street has the warm fuzzies component that they tend to like for best pictures. That certainly didn't hold them back from winning for The Departed, but there was a whole other dynamic going that year. The fact that they're campaigning it in comedy at the Globes tells us that maybe there may be a strong emotional component to this rather than just the, the big theatrical dramatic punch we expect from Marty movies. Right. I mean, I really don't know what this movie is. I know that it's, you know, it sounds like it's going to be a hard R rating. It sounds like it's going to be really long. Um, you, you get the sense from the trailer that I saw, at least, of, of uh, seriously, morally, 
compromised uh, protagonists. But what I can't tell yet is, do, does this movie have any weight? Like, is it about something, or is it just the adventures of these guys who, like, had it and then lost it, and then it was all over? And I think that's the thing we're all waiting to see with Wolf of Wall Street, which is, is it about something? Or is yeah, it just right. a kind of high adrenaline, you know, super caffeinated romp through money culture? I know, I agree with you. The Oscars are not really, I would argue, about picking the best of anything. Nobody on the planet believes Jean Dujardin gave the best dramatic performance of his year. He went along for the ride with this movie that was a delightful film, but I think the Oscars are about uh, Hollywood tattling on itself, uh, telling us who's in and outside, who's in the club, who's out of the club. For example, Russell Crowe is obviously on the outs now, even going back to the year of Master and Commander, everybody on that movie got nominated for an Oscar except the Master and Commander himself. <laughs> so those are, these things are a window into, into the, uh, the whole scene out here. How do you look at these awards? Are, do you really believe they're voting on the best of something, or do you think there's another lesson to be learned when they dole them out every year? Well, I believe that individual voters in their hearts often very much feel that they are voting for the best of something. But collectively is how the Oscars are decided, not individually. And collectively, I'm, I'm sort of with you. I feel like, you know, the Oscars in a way every year are like a suit of clothes or a great dress, and Hollywood is the person trying them on. And every year, they sort of look at themselves in the mirror, and they, they drape a movie over themselves, and they think, you know, this makes me look really good this year. And sometimes it's something that's fun and lighthearted, and sometimes it's something that's deep and socially conscious, and sometimes it's something that's from an outsider, and sometimes it's something from a studio. But it's always about, like, you know, what, what makes me look really good right now? What, wh how, do I, how do I want... Uh, the world to see what I think of as the best we can do. And that changes year to year because the definition of best and the mood about what best means changes from year to year. So, no, I don't think the Oscars are any kind of um, objective measure of quality, but that's fine with me because I don't care about objective measures of quality. I'm much more interested in subjective measures of quality, weird measures of quality, um, t temporary or transient measures of quality, and that's what the Oscars are. I, that's why I like them. There's a guy who, who belongs to the producer's branch as a member of the Academy. I check in every year to find out who he's voting for because he tends to vote for the winner, right? And I'll call him up and I'll say... Uh, uh, so and so, what do you think of the Hurt Locker? And he goes, "Oh, I hate that movie. I don't, garbage. I would never vote for that." And then closer to uh, the actual voting, I'll call him up and say, "Hey, uh, uh, what'd you vote for for Best Picture?" He goes, "Oh, the Hurt Locker. What's what a great movie." <laughs> that happened with the artist too. And uh, and so I'll, I, I'm often trying to figure out what's going on here. He he's he he's clearly he's. I had amnesia about his dislike of the movie or those movies early on. Why is he following the herd? And he's very typical of Oscar voters in general, of course, who they, they often follow the herd. And then I put, posed that question once to Cynthia Swartz, the, one of the great Oscar consultants who we both know, of course. And I said, Cynthia, why does that happen? She had a great answer. She said, they want to be on the winning team. I said, you know what? That makes sense. And then, then she said, however, they will often take one sharp left turn someplace. And as you and I know, as pundits who follow this, it's often in the supporting slot. That's where a Jim Broadbent wins. And uh, Christoph Waltz last year pulls off an upset. And you go, whoa, I should have seen that coming. Do you think that's an inter a, a valid uh, observation about voting patterns? I do. I think it's a, a really valid observation about voting patterns when it comes to best picture. I think that's where they want to be on the winning team. Of course, you and I, you know, share a deep frustration at the fact that we never get to see vote totals, which would, <laughs> you know, tell us, it, it would just be, you know, an unbelievable treasure trove of information about, like, when were we right, when were we wrong, when were we almost wrong that would surprise us. But I do think with Best Picture, yeah, people, people if they do get the sense that momentum is shifting to a particular movie, um, 
it will shift to that movie even a little bit more because people want to be on that um, winning team. They, I think they also vote... They, they want to feel good about their votes. People do envision the person they're voting for getting up and making an acceptance speech. And I think, for instance, when Catherine Bigelow was up against James Cameron a few years ago, you know, you could imagine what it would be like to see the first woman ever to win Best Director get up and have that moment. And knowing that your vote helped put her there, that's a good feeling, as opposed to maybe the less than good feeling if your vote gives Jim, Jim Cameron a second Oscar that moment. Um, so there's a weird emotional uh, element to it, too, but I do think that in the acting categories, people are less prone to that. They're more likely to say... I don't care if this person wins or loses. I thought it was the best performance of the year. Uh, I'm going to um, vote for it. And and that's why sometimes you get surprise winners like um, Adrian Brody or to go much farther back like um, Daniel Day-Lewis for My Left Foot who was uh, you know a surprise uh, winner and a total taste-based choice among the voters the year that he won. You know, that he won purely because people were like, I know that Tom Cruise and Morgan Freeman are up for this. I think Daniel Day-Lewis was the best actor in this category this year. A so major, sometimes it's just about merit. A major theme this year, of course, is uh, African-American films and uh, directors and uh, performers, and they're, they're looking real strong in this race, which I find fascinating as a trend. Of course, I think everybody observing it would say it's long overdue. Uh, I'm wondering how it's going to play out this year when you – Think back not too long ago when to the year of Halle Berry and Denzel winning when they were not the front runners and they had won very little before that. I think Halle had won National Board of Review, lost everything else in between, of course, and suddenly wins at the end. And we had something which we had never seen, of course, which was a win for lead uh, actor and actress in one year. Part of that was because, to the point you just made, Hollywood stood back and they realized, wait a minute, we have an IOU here. We we have a we want to feel good about ourselves. We have a, we need we need to address this issue. We want to uh, recognize uh, people of color, etc. And so suddenly that's a theme again this year. And I, it's, we, how do you think that may play out? Because obviously these movies uh, are being talked about now in the race in terms of being. Uh, worthy of being in there and having campaigns behind them by the studios, but how do you think voter sentiment plays into it from here on in? Well, I think that Academy voters often love the chance to make history, um, and as, as you said, uh, you know, you can't make history really in the acting categories anymore, because uh, a lot of African Americans have, have won now. It's not, it's not a novelty to have uh, an African American Best Actor winner in the wake of, uh, you know, Jamie Foxx winning and Denzel Washington winning and Forrest Whitaker winning. Um, where they can make history is if they give Best Director to Steve McQueen. Um, that would be a, a real milestone. Um, other than that, you know, I think that I'm hoping for uh, what everybody else is hoping for, which is that a lot of African American contenders get into a lot of categories just on uh, the merit of an exceptionally strong year for African American uh, and and uh, British uh, actors and actresses. Um, uh, but uh, I think the other thing we're hoping is that. 12 Years a Slave doesn't become an excuse not to pay attention to, for instance, Fruitvale Station or some of the performances in The Butler. That you know, I, I, I don't think it's inconceivable that there are Academy voters who will see 12 Years a Slave and support it, but also say to themselves on an almost subconscious level, okay, that takes care of that. Now what else am I looking at? And it would be a real shame if people like, you know, uh, Michael B. Jordan or Barkhad Abdi for Captain Phillips, um, you know, or Forrest Whitaker in, in The Butler or Oprah Winfrey uh, didn't get looked at really seriously just because uh, there is this one movie right now that is overshadowing every other movie in the conversation. Okay. Is there anything else we didn't cover here? 
<laughs> Best song, but don't ask me because I have no idea. Okay. Uh, well, let's check in again. You know, in a couple of weeks, is this is this race unfurls because it changes all the time, as we know. What I like about this year is we don't have confidence at all in what's out front. It's not one of those uh, years where we have just one movie just marching through the whole the whole thing. Uh, there's a lot of suspense. I don't buy this 12 Years a Slave thing being out front either. I believe it can win, yes, but I don't think it's a done deal by any means. Listen, as a pundit, I will say the wronger we all are, the more interesting the year is. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I hope... I hope somebody's wrong. Not me, but somebody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're never wrong, Mark. We know that. Uh, I'm wrong a lot. <laughs> Your batting average is, tends to be pretty good. Thanks, Tom. Okay, thank you, Mark. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.